Harvard's authority on linguistics, language construction, and the creative process in general. Uh, today's position from the on how it was constructed, and he's going to explore the implications of his experience with it. Uh, I don't want to waste too much of his time, so without further ado, everybody welcome Dr. Lovelock. So I've just greeted you in Navi, and what I said was, uh, hello everyone. For me to be here speaking to you about the creation of the Navi language is a genuine pleasure and honor, for me. and it really is. Uh, but let me begin with a disclaimer. Tim was very kind, but I have to tell you that even though this is a conference on creativity, I'm really not an expert in that area. <laughs> I haven't done research in the field. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm in no position to discourse on the universal truths of the creative process. However, for several years now, I have been involved in an interesting creative project. And what I can do is share with you what the creative process has been like for me. How much of that is going to be generalizable to a wider domain and to other creators remains to be seen. Hopefully, uh, some of what I will share will be useful. Uh, but just so it's clear, Please think of everything that I'm going to say as being prefaced by the words in my experience, even though I may not mention those explicitly, OK? So uh, let me immediately jump to my main point. In thinking about how to structure the talk, there were a number of things that occurred to me. but. Uh, the one main idea that I'd like to share with you and illustrate today is this. Constraints are your friends. Unbridled freedom is inimical to the creative process. Okay. In my experience, creativity flourishes best within a well-defined structure and with clear constraints. If the structures break down and anything goes, creativity suffers. I've seen this in a number of different areas. I'm, for example, cultures all over the world have developed forms and structures and traditions in which to produce poetry and music and art. In Western culture, if you think about the fugues of Bach, the odes of Horace, the sonnets of Shakespeare, all of that great art was produced within a very well-defined structure and sometimes with very complex and rigid constraints, and yet the art was great. Uh, I love classical music. And one thing that's always interested me about the history of Western classical music is that at the end of the 19th century, the concept of tonality was breaking down. Composers were pushing against the barriers of tonality so that it eventually the walls crumbled there was no more tonality. People didn't have to worry anymore about keys and key relationships and rules for chord progressions. And you think, wow, think of all this freedom. Think how liberating this would be. In fact, for many people, it was just the opposite. It was frustrating, and people found themselves at sea. So much so that famous composer Arnold Schoenberg in 1921 reimposed structure and framework on classical music in the form of 12-tone music, uh, which is arguably more rigid and more constrained than anything that had gone on before. And yet, that is what he found the room. One final example from my own personal life. Um, in the last couple of months, my husband and I have undergone a kind of major life change. We have adopted a vegan diet. Now, we had always been doing quite a bit of cooking, and things had gotten maybe a little bit monotonous. 
So now you think, wow, think of the constraints, right? No meat, no fish, no eggs, no dairy, no butter, no cheese. I love cheese. Okay. <laughs> Turns out, John will verify it, that in fact, this has liberated us to be even more creative. And we're having wild things, wonderful things, which we never would have thought about before. I mean, you know, potato leek soup for breakfast. <laughs> so, uh, that being said, moving on to uh, language. What kind of, oh, okay. What kind of constraints was I under in constructing? Not me, well, there were two main categories, externally imposed and self-imposed. So I'm gonna talk about, about those. Um, what I'm planning to do in the next half hour or so is talk in general about the constraints and then give you a lot of really, really, really illustrations from the language. So I'm going to lay a little grammar on you. Uh, I hope it will be uh, somewhat enjoyable. Okay. So externally imposed constraints. When I got the assignment to create not me, had an incredible meeting for 90 minutes with James Cameron in his offices in Santa Monica. And he let me know some of his visions for the line and some of the things that he had been thinking about. Uh, it was going to be an entirely new language, okay? which means this is a language spoken on a moon revolving around a gas giant planet, four point something light years from here. There's no reason why the language should have any connection whatsoever with anything on Earth. So, uh, it should not, uh, it, 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 it simply should be of its own and the vocabulary should not be connected at all. Kind of makes sense. Make it sound nice. <laughs> okay. Obviously this is an extremely subjective kind of thing and what's nice to one person is kind of weird to another person. Uh, I think what, what Jim was thinking about is maybe make it sound very different from Klingon. Okay. Klingon was, okay, uh, I know Mark Okrand, he's an amazing guy. He deliberately designed Klingon to be harsh and to reflect something about the Klingons themselves, uh, to be quote unquote guttural. Okay. So I kind of, I, I think Jim was thinking about something in the very opposite direction, make it a little bit mellifluous, if, I just, if that succeeded or not. No electronic manipulation of the voices. And this was a big constraint. It meant that whatever the actor said would be the language. Now that said something to me as a language creator, namely that the palette of sounds that I had to work with would be the same sounds of human language. The assumption was that the vocal track of the, not the, the speed producing mechanism was very similar to ours. And so I knew, okay, you have human sounds to work with. That was an important constraint. Stay consistent with Jim Caron's original words. I didn't start from absolute ground zero because in the original script, he had come up with something like 30 words of his own. They were mainly place names. Uh, the word Navi itself was his, the characters, Eitukan, Moat, Sute, Ne. Yeah, they did it a little bit. So, uh, I had an idea of the kind of sound he had in his ear, and I wanted to respect that. So what I did was take those sounds, there was a couple of things that I kind of had, had to eliminate, but take that basic core sound, expand on it, but, uh, but be able to incorporate it into the final sound system of the language. This is a more subtle constraint, but a very important one. This gets, gets into some controversy. By the way, how many of you have seen Avatar? All right. <laughs> That's why you're here. <laughs> okay. uh, as you know, according to the movie, there are a number of humans who have learned language. Now, if humans can learn a language to a linguist, to many linguists, that says something about the structure of language. It has to be a learnable language, and a learnable language is by and large going to be a human life. Language. So that meant that there would be certain things about the structure of the language that I can kind of assume. For example, the idea that 
when things get moved around by various processes and language. The things that are moved around are not words, but phrases, or in more technical terms, constituents. So that's just one of the things I can assume. Finally, it had to be feasible for the actors. Okay, if I came up with something which the actors could not pronounce, obviously that was not gonna work. So this was a real world constraint. Okay, now those are the, the constraints that I had nothing to do with that I, they were simply givens and I had to work with them. They were also self-imposed constraints. So in other words, the way, by the way, not to construct the language is to say, wow, this is amazing. I can do whatever I want. Let's just come up with some new words. If you do that, you will have a mess. Okay, what you need before anything else is structure, is framework. And then, once certain things are established, at that point, you can begin constructing the language itself. So, the language must stand up to scrutiny. Now, I don't like to read things to you, but I do want to read something. Um, one of my heroes is the genius of the American musical theater, uh, Mr. Sondheim. Any, any Stephen Sondheim fans here? Okay. So I was reading a book of his, and in this book, he quotes something that his mentor, Oscar Hammerstein, had written. And Hammerstein was writing it in the context of having seen a photograph, an aerial photograph of the Statue of Liberty. Here's what. Hammerstein wrote. It was a picture taken from a helicopter, and it showed the top of the statue's head. I was amazed at the detail there. The sculptor had done a painstaking job with the lady's coiffure. And yet he must have been pretty sure that the only eyes that would ever see this detail would be the uncritical eyes of seagulls. <laughs> he could not have dreamt that any man would ever fly over this head and take a picture of it. He was, a, he was artist enough, however, to finish off this part of the statue with as much care as he had devoted to her face and her arms and the torch and everything that people can see as they sail up the bay. He was right. When you're creating a work of art or any other kind of work, finish the job off perfectly. You never know when a helicopter or some other instrument, <laughs> not at the moment invented, may come along and find you out. I, it's not a perfect analogy, but I really kind of related to that. If you think about it, you know, how many people are going to go into the movie theater and really understand what's going on with the language, as opposed to saying, oh, it's a foreign language. Not many. However, there are going to be people. And I, 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 I kind of knew that. And for that reason, I wanted the language to stand up to scrutiny, so that if a linguist took a look at it, the linguist would say, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. That's a job well done. And if someone who wanted to learn the language look at it, that person would see consistency and hopefully some elegance and so on. So that's what I mean by standing up to scrutiny. I wanted to make it interesting. I'll be talking a little bit more about, about what interesting might mean in that, in that context. I wanted to make it unusual. After all, this is spoken many, many, like, many miles away. Uh, it shouldn't, it shouldn't mirror or reflect too much of what is very common on Earth, and yet still be a human learnable language. I want to balance complexity with accessibility. What I mean by that is, I have to admit that as I was doing it, having knowledge of what had gone on with Klingon, I had a sense that maybe some people might be wanting to look at it. I had no idea to what extent that would be, but even at that point, I wanted to come up with something which would have a good balance. In other words, nothing so simple that anybody could learn it but just would have no interest for anybody. And the other extreme is having something so incredibly complex that people would simply throw up their hands and say, I'm never going to learn this. So I wanted to come up with something in the middle, and hopefully, uh, I achieved that because people, but the response I've gotten has, has, has been pretty good for people who are trying to do it. And then, of course, I wanted to come up with a framework for the language. And the way you think about this, the way people typically think about this, 
is in terms of what you might call modules. You begin with phonetics and phonology, the sounds and sound system of the language. You kind of try to nail that down first. You go out to morphology, the rules for constructing words. We want to syntax and rules for putting words together in phrases and sentences. And in all that, you have to keep in mind the relationship between language and culture and environment. Because every language, wherever it is, reflects to some extent the culture and environment, the physiology of the speaker. So all of those have to be kept in mind. Okay. So those are the kinds of things, the kinds of constraints that were placed upon me that I uh, that I put on myself. So now what I'd like to do is kind of go through those modules and look at aspects of each one to see what sort of things I came up with, maybe why, and, um, and get a sense of what the language actually looks like. So, phonetics and phonology, sounds and sound systems. Okay, so the language has consonants and vowels. And here's the consonant system of the language. How many of you are linguists or have had some linguistics? Great. Wow. Okay. So uh, you're extremely familiar then with the way this chart is set up. Uh, these are the consonants in the language. By the way, I have to tell you right off the bat, which you can tell immediately, this is not IPA. This is not the International Phonetic Alphabet. This is, in fact, the spelling system that I came up for. Now, I think it's pretty transparent. It's something that the actors could look at and understand, and it, it seems to work pretty well. So uh, what you have here, uh, horizontal lines represent, uh, re 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 the rows represent kinds of consonants. The columns represent where the consonant is taking place in your mouth. Uh, this, is, this is front, this is back. Okay. So what do you see there? Well, there's some very familiar consonants. Uh, this is actually a glottal stop. That's the, we have it marginally in English. That's the sharp break in the expression, uh-oh. Okay, in uh-oh, there's a consonant there. That consonant is a glottal stop. So the glottal stop is important in Navi, uh, represented by an apostrophe. Uh, this is ts, fairly well known in many languages. Uh, these are the ones that have attracted most attention. And these are genuine human speech sounds. They're called ejectives, produced with a glottalic airstream mechanism. They sound a little bit, a little bit like ah, ah, <coughs> ooh, <coughs> eh. Okay, they're sort of popping consonants. They're not clicks, but popping consonants. Uh, are they found in human languages? You bet. Uh, North American languages, Native North American languages, they're found in Africa, in Ethiopia, they're found in the Caucasus. So uh, I included these because I want to add a little bit interest. Okay, I, I want to avoid the word exoticism because what's exotic to one is just very down home to another. But uh, these do add a sort of distinctive sound to the language and, and they've kind of caught on. The actors had fun with them too. Uh, it's just as important to note what you don't see. So there are some very common speech sounds which are not there. There's no b, there's no d, there's no g. If you see a purported, not any word with a b in it, sorry, can't be. Uh, those exclusions are not accidental. There are groups of sounds that are being excluded. This difficult voice stops. When you choose a certain subset of speech sounds and exclude everything else, what you get is something with some distinctive character. Going back to the cooking analogy again, if you're cooking soup, what you don't do is open your spice cabinet and throw in everything. If you do, you get a, a, a mishmash, which probably has no distinctive character and may not taste very good. But if you're judicious, you take a little bit of this, a little bit of this, not this, but a little bit of that, you can get something that has some character. So hopefully, choices like this help not be have its distinct character. Okay, so you've got this, you've got consonants. What about vowels? Okay, seven vowel system. It, uh, e, e, u, o, e, a, a. Pseudo vowels, u, uh, and r. <coughs> Diphthongs, au, i, a. And this one is a little bit unfamiliar, eu. 
makes a nice symmetric sail. Now, those are the sounds. Are you finished? No, because there's a lot more to talk about in terms of the sound system. For example, are there any constraints on where sounds go? Well, the answer is yes. The red consonants are the only ones that can be in syllable final position, therefore in word final position. A word can only end with these red consonants. A not the word cannot end in S, cannot end in F, and so on. What about the way consonants come together? Those are called consonant clusters. Are consonant clusters familiar to English speakers? Absolutely. English has some wild consonant clusters. My favorite, favorite example is this one here, strengths. Okay, the word strengths has three consonants in the beginning, and actually, depending on how you pronounce it, I pronounce it with four, with a cut in there, it has four consonants at the end. That's a, that's a one-syllable word, I mean, it's amazing. Okay, most languages are nowhere near this extravagant with consonant clusters. Many languages don't allow consonant clusters at all. Japanese, for example, Hawaiian. So it does not be allowed consonant clusters, yes, but in a very restrictive way. Oh, um, let me just mention a couple other things. In terms of consonant clusters, brick is a word, perfectly good English word. Blick is not. This is, this is a standard example from any linguistics 101 class. You've probably seen it before. Uh, but it could be. In fact, it's a perfectly good German word, by the way, and it's also, I think, the name of an art supply store. Oh. <laughs> Bnick is not a word and could not be because English does not allow a B and consonant cluster in initial position. So those are the kinds of things you have to think about. Okay, so here's what the, here's what consonant clusters are allowed. Two consonants at the beginning of a syllable is possible, but only these. F, S, or S followed by this set of consonants. This is not an arbitrary set. Uh, you can see here more closely that these are the ones that can be in first position and the blue consonants are the ones that can be in second position. Now this results in some pretty strange consonant clusters. Some of which I've never seen in a human language but they're all, I, I can pronounce them, everybody else can, so they're all quite possible. Uh, not F and the vela nasal na is possible. Akim, skom, skeli. I, I kind of like this word. Ske. Ske. It actually appeared in the movie. Snavik. Uh, and so on. Okay. Uh, this, by the way, results in 8,609 possible not these syllables. Uh, not huge, but also not minimal. If you consider two syllable words, how many possible two-syllable words are there? Of course, it's this squared, which is this. So over 75 million possible two-syllable words. That, that's plenty. And it's only two-syllable. OK, are we now done with the sound system? No, because you have to talk about pronunciation rules, sound processing. So for example, here are some not be nouns. OK, the word for in is mi. How do you say in the I? There's no the, by the way. Minad. How do you say in the world? Mehifke. How do you say in the water? Mefad. In the spirit? Mesirea. In the heart? Meteelan. In the lake? Meora. Okay, now something's going on here. Uh, and you notice that the initial consonant after me is changing, and it's changing in some odd ways. Some of this will look very, very familiar to people who have studied. Languages like well, Hebrew, for example, uh, perhaps some of the Celtic languages. Uh, this is stuff that I've never seen before, but it works in the system. So it's a process called lenition, which is very familiar to linguists. Eight consonants part, uh, partake in it. These are the ones that change in those circumstances, in certain circumstances. And um, this will give you a little schematic of what changes to what under certain triggers, which I won't go into. This stuff is, these sounds changing to these are very familiar. This I've never seen before. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist in language. I'm unfamiliar with this. 
But this is part of the creativity that, that I hope I brought to the language, the innovation part. It's taking a process that exists and tweaking it, expanding it, making it something that still works and is still logical, but just does not happen to be found, as far as I know, in human languages, uh, where adjectives are weakened to stop. So that's, that's part of the sound system. OK, uh, morphology. Verbs. Language says verbs. Here's the root, taro. Okay, here's some verb forms. Verbs are not inflected for person and number. There's no agreement between the verb and the subject, but they are inflected for tense, aspect, mood, and so on. Uh, so from taro, you get tolaron, which means hunted or has hunted, tayaron, will hunt, tievaron, my hunt, tiermareon, has just hunted. And I feel good about it. Really? <laughs> OK. Um, so I'm going to move on a bit. Um, this shows you what's going on with the verbs. Notice that rather than using prefixes or suffixes, you're using infixes. The stuff that you're just taking the root, cleaving it in half, shoving stuff in the middle. Okay. Uh, Some not we people came up with uh, what they thought was maybe the most elaborate use of infixes. And this sentence means, I'm so jazzed that he may be about to drink himself to death. <laughs> and um, I, 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 won't, I won't go into the, the whole etymology of the thing, the whole way it's set up. But uh, here's the root. The root is terco. Okay? All of this stuff is infixes. And you actually do get that meaning. Could people actually learn this language? Could people hear this and and think, oh, that's from Turco? I don't know. I think I think so. Uh, in the interest of time, I have a lot more on the cases of pronouns and so on. Uh, okay, so it, it 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 has a case system that's called tripartite, which is a little bit unusual. Cases are essentially markers on nouns that indicate how they function grammatically in the sentence, whether the subject, object, indirect object, and so on. Very useful. Uh, if you look at an English sentence, educai sees nekiri, and permute it in all the possible ways, well, that's good. This is not English. This is English, but it has a different meaning, and the rest are not English. In Navi, you can commute the sentence in all six different ways, and they're, and they're all grammatical and going in the same time. Why? Because of the case system of the nouns. Um, I'm going to go, th I'm going to skip over this right now. One of the hallmarks of, if we have time, we'll go back to it later. One of the hallmarks of Navi syntax is word order flexibility. And so, Word order is anything but rigid. You can put things in a number of different orders. One of the reasons I did this was that I was thinking of the practical requirements of working with actors. Realizing that it would be really nice if an actor was having trouble saying a sentence in, in a certain way, if I could maybe rearrange things, still have the sentence grammatical, it might actually come out to be a lot more pronounced. So, uh, Genitives can come either before or after the noun. Adjectives can come before or after the noun. Notice that the connecting a ah is in between in both cases. Relative clauses, same thing. We don't have prepositions or postpositions. We have adpositions because adpositions can be either before or after. Okay. Now, language, culture, and environment. I noticed when I was looking at illustrations that the Navi have four digits on each hand and not five. So I said to Jim Cameron, probably this means that they have an octal numerical system rather than decimal. He said, absolutely. So the way you count in Navi is al mona eight sin mur puka kina vo, that's one to eight. Nine is volau, eight and one. Ten is vo mo so. Now, Every language has 
idioms and expressions and proverbs that reflect culture, that reflect the nature of the language. Um, we had a contest in the Navi community to come up with some good proverbs. One of the ones that, that I, I really like, oh wow, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> the tail and ears also speak. If you saw the movie, you know that the tail and ears are very, very expressive. So this is saying, don't just listen to the words, look at the body language as well. This is what I came up with. Right back and forth. And I think the mantis doesn't whistle. And the intent is, don't expect anyone to do something against his or her intrinsic nature. One of the reasons I like it is that it not only makes use of stuff that is on the planet, but it plays with the sounds. So, fuerte que fuerte is, is, is kind of fun to say. <laughs> and I can actually see it as being a real, uh, a real problem on Pandora. Uh, <laughs> there's honorific language which reflects the fact that ceremonies are important. There's specific vocabulary which reflects concepts that are important to the method. Mewa uniaea, from my favorite words, uh, means harmony, living in balance with nature. Okay. Once all the structure is in place, at that point you can say, hey, let's begin coming up with some words. How do you come up with words in the language you're inventing? There are actually a number of specific ways. One is borrow. This is rare, but it does, it does occur. Um, if a culture is in contact with another culture, your concepts in this culture, which they want to talk about, but the concepts don't exist in their culture, if the conditions are right, they will simply borrow a term and filter it through their own sound system. So the word for book in Navi is book. Presumably they got that word from the sky people and from Dr. Grace's class. So uh, the word for gunship is kunsip obviously, where the earth is rata. This is, as I say, rare, but does occur. There are also derivational processes. Every language has ways of converting from verbs to nouns and from nouns to adjectives and things like that. So we have that in Navi as well. So taron, verb you've seen already, hunt. Some nouns that come from it is titaron, the abstract concept of hunting, setaron, a specific instance of hunting, Hunter. So these are consistent processes that can be used to coin new words. This is more interesting, combining existing forms. So the word for interested, to be interested, is el tutensi. What it really means is to awaken the brain. We had the word for brain, we had the word for awaken. Interesting is awaken the brain. Uh, word for computer also uses a word for brain, el metal brain. A word I came up with uh, about five or six weeks ago, actually in point of fact. And this comes from an earlier phrase, uh, anai is the adjective for real, is situation, ne is an adverb form. So it's really real situational. Okay. And then over the years, over the centuries, words would have changed due to processes of assimilation and truncation and so on. So this came up to be that word. Finally, there's what everyone thinks about it, just come up with totally new stuff. Okay, so how do you do that? I don't know. I, 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 uh, this is kind of the mysterious part. I mean, you could have a computer program to it. Program a computer to construct syllables in keeping with the constraints of the language and just simply randomly assign them to meanings. And some, some people do that. I didn't want to do that. I, I, just, I just love rolling things around in my mouth and thinking, does this really work? Does it feel good to say this word to mean this certain thing? Uh, Lord is beautiful. Uh, Eving is child. Who will is cloud. I kind of, I kind of like that, but people seem to like that one too. Uh, <laughs> vrtep is demon. Okay. Uh, 
easy and difficult to do it. Now there are times when I kind of <laughs> indulged in what linguists and philosophers call iconicity. Okay. There is really no intrinsic relationship between the form of a word and its meaning. But sometimes there is a reflection. And so here are the words for smooth and rough. Smooth is foul, we rough is uh, in playing around with I realized that you can actually put two of these injectives together and you can, you can say it. It's kind of fun to say. Uh, now, could it have been the other way around? Yeah, but somehow this really feels rough and this really feels smooth. Okay. Have you got five minutes? Two minutes, okay. Not the post avatar sharing their phrases. One of the great joys, unexpected joys, of having been involved in this process is that a community has arisen, a worldwide community of people who have embraced the language, who want to learn it, who are using it for genuine communication. I get emails to be written in not the old time. <laughs> uh, okay, this was one of my very first emails. Okay, uh, a, a linguistic anthropologist at the University of British Columbia, Dr. Christine Schreier actually did a study on the Navi community worldwide and presented it to the American Anthropological Association. Okay, uh, these are some great people. I have made lifelong friends in the community. Uh, this is at one of our very early meetings, this was in 2010. They were reenacting the scene from Avatar. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, there's a little outdoor class I taught. This was the very first get together in October 2010. Okay, since then there have been more formal classes. Uh, <laughs> someone in the class, oh yeah. The, 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 the next meeting, by the way, is gonna be in Los Angeles in, uh, in July. Uh, some of the crea creativity of the Navi group can be seen here. Uh, up in the corner is a, um, is a review of the movie Inception, written entirely in Navi. Some other things you can see. I have my own blog now where I introduce new material. Um, just another, another minute or two. So, and one of the great things is that it has allowed other people to exercise their creative. So we had a haiku contest. And this was the, one of the winners. Srao ma frapo srao. Oh, I'm sorry. Srao ma frapo srao. Ao a eo Really a nice haiku. The second line, in fact, is the longest to say and the shortest to write. Kind of cute. Uh, and this is one of my absolute favorite examples of creativity in the network community. Um, this is part of a beautiful, sensitive, ruminative essay written by someone uh, who had just become an uncle. His niece had just been born, and he was talking about what it would be like. Imagine what it would be like for, for this new being in the world, no longer in the mother's womb, experiencing all these new things, experiencing hunger, experiencing voices of people, and also experiencing apparently diarrhea <laughs> because the baby was having some problems. So we wanted to write this, and now like, how do you write diarrhea? Well, guess what? We don't have a word for that yet. So what do you do? Here's a place where he exercises creativity. So we had a word, a verb. Or to mean explode. <laughs> we have we had a word snell meaning garbage, waste, trash. <laughs> and we had an adjective meaning body. And what he came up with was Usura Smelatok, which means explosive body waste. <laughs> and I absolutely love it. Okay. Uh, one one more thing about, about creativity and 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 I'll, and I'll end. The community wants more vocabulary, and that's perfectly understandable. And early on, what they said to me was, please give us words for this, 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 this. I, in 2010 or 11, I received a 100-page document with requests for vocabulary, and that was fine. I soon realized that there were enough people who were absolute experts in the language, who knew the constraints just as well as I did, they could actually come up with not just requests for vocabulary, but suggestions for vocabulary. And so that's what we do now. There's a whole committee, which they've set up themselves, 
uh, <laughs> rotating chair. I mean, it's amazing. And every month or so, I get a document with suggestions from the world. I can do one of three things. I can say, this is fantastic. I love it. It's part of the language. I'm still the gatekeeper, by the way. The only one who can decide officially if something is in or out is me. <laughs> I can say, this has potential. I think we need to tweak it. I can say, we can do this better. And it's all submitted anonymously, so no one has ownership of anything. And no one feels, <clears throat> feels hurt if I say, let's do it another way. But how wonderful it will it be with that you know, someone is sitting in the theater watching one of the sequels, or the three sequels, and hears something on the screen and say, that's my work. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's fantastic. Anyway, uh, I'm out of time. Uh, let me leave you with a nice not be valediction. Ewangaho, which means it will be with you. Ewa, the great mother who protects the balance of life. So, Ewangaho, and thanks so much.